This video demonstrates three experiments that reject standard models in physics today. An amateur scientist can do these experiments. The first two reject the wave models of light, including QED. The third rejects the boyer severo law in magnetostatics. Let's do them. Photon diffraction is a central mystery of subatomic particles. The equipment for the experiment is we have a laser pointer. I have a paper clip holding the button down so the laser light will stay on. I took business cards, cut out a hole in the business cards, and placed a piece of aluminum foil over the hole. I then cut a slit in the aluminum foil. Uh, it's, it's important for the experiment that the mask be as thin as possible and that there be no index or refraction kind of concerns. There's the double slit. So this is the experiment. This is just a laser pointer, which is easily available to even amateurs. It's directing its laser beam onto a slit. This is a single slit. Now this produces a diffraction pattern. And there you see the diffraction pattern projected on a white background, which is about 8 meters away. This is the screen image from the light through the first slit onto the screen, which you saw was 8 meters away. This is a normal diffraction pattern. The laser directs a coherent light at a first mask with a slit in it. That produces a diffraction pattern here, and we have a second mask then that selects a portion of the diffraction pattern, and then several meters distance we have a screen where the image of that is impinged. The position of the second mask, this is the slit width, and you'll notice the width is about half the distance between the first minima around the central peak. There's the center line or zero of the experiment, and here is what is projected on the screen. Therefore, this light here is coherent, and it's doing what coherent light is supposed to do. Perhaps someone with a photon counter could do this experiment for better definition between the peaks. The second part of the experiment is to change the position of the second mask so that one edge of the slit is over the central peak, the other edge of the slit is over the first minima, and this is the result on the screen. You will note that the maxima is slightly to the right of the zero and declines as it goes left. This is a little spur that is actually part of the central maxima, and here are the two secondary peaks. For the double slit, we position one slit over the central peak maxima, and the other slit over the first minima. When I change the camera exposure, we can see that the central peak has the interference fringes. Change the exposure back so it's detecting the secondary peaks, and you see that they are there also. This is the simulation. Central peak, interference fringes, secondary peak. Wave models of light predict the brighter diffraction pattern should be on the left rather than on the right, or spread across both sides of the screen. Therefore, this experiment rejects wave models of light. The laser beam is directed onto a second mask. The second mask consists of glass plates. This is just normal window pane glass. And you see here the direct diffraction pattern goes through the glass. Now, this part of the experiment is known as the Hodge experiment, which was explored in an earlier video. This is experiment B, 
where we put a piece of glass between the first slit and the screen, the glass is transmitting the image fairly well. Now we direct the laser beam and this diffraction pattern through a very narrow slit, about a half a millimeter across, between two pieces of glass. You'll see there is the diffraction pattern. This is the third experiment where we put the slit over the center of the diffraction pattern. And you see what you get here, if you can see these little lines here, those are interference fringes in all the various sections of the diffraction pattern. And here's an expanded view of this area in here. We put a nail in the path of the light. And you can see that the center portion of the light, here of the diffraction pattern, is totally on the nail. The blocking nail edges are at the minima of the diffraction image. No light through the slit. Now let's see that. This is the edge of a mask, and here we position, position the edge right in the middle of the diffraction pattern. The image on the screen of this kind of setup is like this. So here you can see the diffraction pattern on that side, but there's the center of the image. This comes through, but more importantly for this experiment, a lot of light comes through behind the mask. Now, traditional physics explains this. But this is what happens when you put the edge of a blocking mask at the minima of a diffraction pattern. What you see here and it's kind of hard to follow this down, but still, there's a very small amount of light that comes right just inside the mask here, and then the rest of the diffraction pattern follows. The point is that where the center peak used to be, there's no light. That's to say the first minima are on each side of the nail. That the light from the center portion, that is to say the light that was going through the slit, is no longer going through the slit, as you can see here. But yet, there's no light going through the slit, but yet the interference pattern remains. And here you see where we put the nail in. The nail is right, this is the shadow of the nail. And there's a couple things to notice. One is the diffraction pattern is intact. These are interference fringes and they are still there when the center of the image is blocked. <clears throat> Another thing I'll note is you see a very faint piece of light right there and right there. And the nail shadow is right in here. So there's no light coming in where the nail is, where the center peak used to be. And we still have interference fringes without light going through the slit. Traditional science requires light to pass through slits in order to form the interference pattern. This experiment places the slits one in front of the other, but we still have a diffraction image, and we still have a second slit that is causing the diffraction pattern to go to an interference pattern. The second introduces the interference friction. This is then a double slit experiment, just not what you usually think of as one. Now, the light from the center of the first slit is blocked, and we saw by putting that edge of the slit at the minima, all the light is blocked. There's no light going through the slit. Therefore, the remainder of the first slit diffraction pattern passes through the glass and is coherent. So you can see this video for a discussion on what coherence is. The resulting interference pattern is not formed by the interference of light through the second mask slit. And of course, the light going through the glass isn't changed either. 
So therefore, the mere presence of a slit must form the interference pattern. Now, traditional science cannot explain this. And wave models of light don't explain this. The integration is around the entire circuit. Here I have two disc magnets. If you'll note that if both sides north is up, they repel. If one is north and the other is south, they attract. We're going to use this to detect current in the wire and the resulting magnetic field. Here is a disc magnet. I've attached it to a piece of wood and mounted it on a weight scale. Now there's a small gap of about half a millimeter here and we've attached two wires that's going to provide current. Here then is a multimeter. I turn it to the uh, resistance range and you see it's measuring about four tenths of an ohm through this current path. Let's change back to voltage. Here is the battery. And what I'm going to do is attach the terminal to the battery. Now, this is not, there's some problems here. When I attach the terminals, the battery is going to provide a lot of current. It's going to actually discharge the battery faster than it should. And therefore, things are going to get hot and the battery is not going to last too long. And the, and the current level is going to be varying. So we need to be quick about this and not take too much time in the actual measurement. I'll attach one terminal. I'm going to turn on the scale, the weight scale. It's reading zero because it's zeroed with that weight on there. So let me attach the battery. You see that we're measuring a voltage, which means the current is flowing. And this is reading 0.36. Now, for the first experiment, change the terminal direction so the current's going to flow in the other direction. Attach the battery again. And this time I'm measuring minus 0.38. Now, that means instead of being uh, attractive, it's repulsive. And therefore, this, the current in this back bar is actually pushing the magnet. The next experiment is to move the electrodes here very close to the magnet. Now we're measuring 0.39, which is very close to what we had in the full length of the magnet. That means the current and the magnetic field produced in this part and this part are having no effect on the magnet here. It's only the current over the magnet. To see this, let's do one more little test. Here, all the current is going to be on one side through the back bar here and not over the magnet. We're getting a voltage reading, we're getting current, and the reading here is zero. That is to say, there's current flowing here, but there's no magnetic force being exerted on that magnet. This means the Boyle-Sivir law is rejected.